There's a lot I could say about Babylon 5, but today my focus is on how it's one of the best science fiction takes on proxy wars that's ever made it to screen, even if the visuals are a bit dated. It's often been compared to Star Trek Deep Space Nine, as both are set on space stations, they tell the story of a major war, and we're on around the same time. But there's a crucial difference that affects every aspect of the narrative. In DS9, the human-dominated Federation is a superpower. It's America stepping into a regional conflict. In Babylon 5, Earth is firmly third world, swept up as a proxy in someone else's war. I mean third world in the original sense. Free world versus communist world, with the third world where they instigate little wars against each other. It's not an economic assessment. So the setup. The major powers in the galaxy have agreed to send ambassadors to a neutral space station, like the UN in a tube. The impetus for this being that a decade prior, the Earth Alliance fought a war against the Minbari Federation over a misunderstanding. Or rather, the Earth Alliance got viciously slapped around for a couple of years before the Minbari abruptly decided to quit instead of exterminating humanity. The why of that decision is one of the many threads woven throughout the narrative. In some ways, the Earth Alliance is comparable to the Federation of original series Star Trek. It's optimistic, it's just beginning to stretch its hand out into the cosmos, full of idealism and vigor. At the start of the story, it's represented by Commander Sinclair of the Earth Alliance military. Also commanding officer of the station, which seems like a conflict of interest, but we'll go with it because a TV show about ambassadors arguing would be a bit dull. The Minbari Federation, represented by Ambassador Delenn, is an older civilization that has become kind of stagnant. The Minbari have long had a sense of something slipping away from them. There's something tragic about their apparent tranquil stability. And probably the best character arcs of the series, we have Londo Malari representing the Centauri Republic, which is sort of like the UK or France in that it used to be a great power with a vast empire, but is now far past its imperial prime. A second tier power bereft of its past glory living off memories and stories. And Jakar, representing the Narn regime, recently liberated after generations of brutal occupation under the Centauri. Jakar is hungry for status, angry but proud, pushing for a seat at the great power table and violently sensitive to any perceived slight. But he's not just some brutal thug. No one here is exactly what he appears. Additionally, a much older civilization, the Vorlons, have deigned to send their ambassador Kosh to the station, though he seems completely uninterested in doing ambassador stuff. Kosh is so above this. And so the stage is set, and a great war is brewing. This is where it gets interesting from the historical and cultural perspective. Keep in mind that Babylon 5 premiered in 1993. The Soviet Union had collapsed just two years before, and the consequences of that massive geopolitical shift were rippling through the world in a tsunami of hope and violence. Now the Minbari. They have an alliance with the Vorlons going back a thousand years to a war they fought together against an evil enemy known as the Shadows. If this doesn't seem like we're getting an entirely objective account here, it's because the Minbari are just as duped as we are. What they think of as an alliance is really just their being the Vorlons' most useful proxy. The Vorlons in the shadows, like the United States and the Soviet Union, had a deep ideological disagreement, but they didn't fight each other directly. They use other, less advanced civilizations to do the fighting. Both find younger worlds that they can manipulate. They give aid, they provide information, but neither side will strike directly at the other. The Minbari have long been under the influence of the Vorlons. The Centauri, a declining empire desperately clinging to the last vestiges of former greatness, are easy marks for the shadows. I want it all back the way that it was! This leaves Earth and Narn in play. The Vorlons have been grooming Earth for some time, most notably through genetic manipulation to create telepaths for reasons I won't get into here. But the shadows, like an interstellar CIA, engineer a regime change. Earth's president is killed in an accident and the vice president is sworn in. The new administration is much more amenable to the shadows. 
What's notable here isn't that the installed president takes Earth into a militaristic dictatorship, but that the show takes its time getting there. It's a gradual shift, little policy changes, a media focus on alien threats, new agencies focused on security, encouragement to snitch on colleagues for potentially dangerous comments. See something, say something. Tyranny generally doesn't declare itself openly like a Sith Lord. It grows slowly, tied to the familiar until it becomes familiar. It gets its claws into us in ways that at first seem insignificant. What's that? What? Oh, nothing. I figured what the hell. Earth wants to throw around its money, who am I to say no? 50 extra credits a week to walk around and do what I do anyway? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but before you know it, people are disappearing for thought crimes, the shadows are setting up shipyards, and everyone is too scared to resist. But Babylon 5 doesn't just show us Earth in the grip of totalitarianism. This is Earth as an emerging power, turned into a pawn, caught between two superpowers locked in an ideological battle over things that really don't have a whole lot to do with us. If our government isn't compliant enough, that can be fixed with a little regime change. Until we stand up and say no, we won't be used, we decide our destiny. Babylon 5 is a coming of age story for civilizations. It's about the younger spacefaring powers learning to stand on their own and finding their own way instead of being led by the older civilizations that reveal themselves to be no better, just more experienced at making mistakes. In time, the Vorlons and the Shadows both pass into history. But those superpowers leave a legacy. They leave technology that less advanced people can use without really understanding. The giants have left the playground, but they left their guns behind. They leave behind proxies who are bitter after losing everything in the war only to be cast off. History doesn't end, it rolls on with new players and new struggles. The great powers used their proxies to achieve short-term goals, but they couldn't predict the long-term consequences of their interference. Consequences that continue to destroy entire worlds long after their war is forgotten. It's the essential post-Cold War story, and unfortunately, it's a concept that seems to elude most of today's policymakers. There are some great comparisons to be made between Bab 5 and Mass Effect, another story with a young upstart humanity muscling its way to prominence through brashness and luck.